Hi everybody, I'm Tom McQuillan, a software development engineer, and I've been asked quite a few times to do a recording of the presentation I did at NI Days in London earlier this year. The presentation was all about how I future-proof my code with object-oriented programming. So I want to start this presentation by going through the ideal situation to help identify why we need to future-proof our code. So the ideal situation is we have a kickoff meeting with our customer and we discuss a set of requirements that we can both sign off on. We can go away and design, develop, test and deploy the code. And then that results in a really happy customer. And if we have a happy customer, we're a happy developer. In fact, the customer is so happy with us that they come back to you and extend the requirements of the software. So you go away, you add the extra functionality or hardware support, and then you're left with a really happy and loyal customer. But in this simple six-stage process, there's one key difficult area, and that is adding the extra functionality. Let's say we had a situation like this, where we wrote some code for an Agilent uh, 34401 DMM or digital multimeter. Now you can see the code looks very nice and neat. Uh, there's good VI icons, there's good documentation, it's very well structured. However, your customer comes back to you and says, okay, the code looks great, but could you make it so I could use an NI4081 DMM as well, which is a PXIE card? And because we want to please the customer, we say, absolutely. But now it transforms our really well written code into a piece of code with lots of nested structures and actually changes um, our already tested and commissioned code. Now that's really bad news because if we change commissioned code, it means we then need to a, recommission it, but also carry on testing it. And this is a prime candidate for um, introducing bugs. So to future-proof our code, we want to be able to add functionality to the software without changing the already working and more importantly tested code. We just don't want to risk it. So the way that I solve this issue with my software is to develop object-oriented code or object-oriented programming code. And with it, we represent components or like the nouns, the things as classes. And those classes encapsulate the functionality in LabVIEW, that functionality is VIs, and the data or clusters required to execute that functionality or task. Let's take this as an example. We've made the things or the nouns into classes. So now we have an Agilent class and a CSV class, where CSV is a type of file format. And we want to send data from the Agilent DMM to the CSV uh, file. And that's fine. And then your customer decides, OK, I want to move away from the Agilent DMM and introduce support for the NI DMM. OK, that's fine. By using object-oriented programming, we could just create a brand new class and have that class communicate with the other file format. But then you realise that CSV files are awful. So you move towards a TDMS class, which stands for a Technical Data Management Streaming. It's a great way of organising your data. But you're still going to have some customers who are using the Agilent DMM. And so you'll end up with a situation where either the Agilent or NIDMM need to communicate with both the CSV class and the TDMS class. And object-oriented programming allows us to well, do just that. The first pillar of OOP I want to share with you is encapsulation. So a class is a custom data type and the methods that interact with that data. So a class bundles the methods and the data together. So let's have a look at the screenshot on the board here. The custom data type is a DOM or document object model 
Now that's the type of reference used uh, to interact with XML files. Some of the methods that use that method, or sorry, some of the methods that use that reference are the following. So load XML file, create XML file, create root tag, delete tag, save and close file. Now, the important thing I want to stress here is that class data is private, which means only the VIs in the class can access it. Now, you might think that's a hindrance, but actually, I know from experience, if there is a bug in your code, let's say if there's a bug in writing data to an XML file, the only place in your code where you're writing to that file or reading from that file is in the class itself because that's the only location where they have access to that private data. So we've created really debuggable code because the only place that bug could have occurred is in the class itself. Here we have an example of um, how we've encapsulated the functionality and the data that executes that functionality or helps us to. So here we've encapsulated this uh, free invoke nodes, and they are using the private data to perform the functionality. With object-oriented programming, it lends itself very nicely to creating a very neat API. So you can see here that all of these functions appear like they belong together. And in fact, we could add those functions to uh, the functions palette in LoveView. Uh, for more information on how to add functions to a palette, a check out the VI Package Manager by JKI. But object-oriented programming is so much more than creating an API or an application programming interface. It lends itself very nicely to creating an API. However, depending on the software we configure, we might want the functionality of the API to change. Let's take this as an example. Both the Agilent and the NIDMM need to initialize, but they're going to do it in different ways. And in fact, the software you write won't know until runtime which DMM is connected, and therefore which initialize.vi to use. And that's where inheritance comes in. Now that's the second pillar I want to talk about. The first was encapsulation, and now we have inheritance. Inheritance allows child classes to reuse the data and methods of a base class. So let's say we had a base class called DMM and two child classes of Agilent and NI. The base class could have a placeholder initialize DMM uh, dot VI, then the child classes override that. So the child class may choose to override or append the functionality of the base class. Let's have a look at a different example. Here we have three classes, a camera class, a simulation class, and a webcam class. The base class, or the parent class, contains four methods, which are initialize camera, start acquisition, get image, and clean up camera. Those four methods are completely empty on their block diagram. They have no functionality. And they are dynamic dispatch methods. That means that the child classes of simulation and webcam, they can take those methods and override them. So simulation class is overriding get image, and the functionality that get image will do is load a file, load an image from file, and display it on the screen. Whereas the webcam, that's decided to override all four methods because it actually needs to interact with the hardware. The data required to interact with that hardware is the iMacDX session reference, which you can see in the middle box of the webcam class. In the next video, I'm going to go through how we can actually create one of these classes.